I'm a morning person. I never set an alarm, but somehow I always wake up on my own around 4 a.m. I feel this habit gives me a jump on the day, but my wife feels this habit is both unnatural and freakish. Since our weather is often so nice here in San Antonio, I'll sometimes spend these early mornings sitting out on our back porch. I'll bring out my laptop and knock out some work before the rest of the family wakes up. I find I can get a lot done when the rest of the world is silent and still. Of course, the early morning in San Antonio isn't always completely silent, nor is it completely still. As a matter of fact, at exactly 6.30, it can get a little noisy. That's when something unusual happens. That's when the quiet of the morning is broken by what sounds like a clap of distant thunder. Whenever I hear that morning boom, I can't help but wonder about the story behind it. To be honest, this is something I've wondered about for years. But this year is different. This year, I have a reason to investigate such mysteries. This year, I have a podcast. Hi, I'm Brantley Hightower. Together with the Revard Report, we're launching a new podcast called The San Antonio Storybook. In each episode, we'll tell a different tale about the people and places that define San Antonio. The idea is simple. Each episode will be like a chapter in a book, a book that tells the story of who we are as a city. Some chapters will tell stories of adventure, others will tell stories of romance, but today's chapter will be a mystery. But whatever the type of story, we'll try to tell you one you haven't heard before. Stories about the people behind the headlines. Stories about the places you drive by every day and the sounds you hear every morning. So let's get started, shall we? My keenly honed journalistic instincts tell me that the morning boom has something to do with a large army base located a few miles south of my home. I figured they have some big cannon there they fire to wake up all the soldiers on base. But to find out for sure, I thought I might sneak onto Fort Sam Houston one morning. If I could devise a way to make it past the fences, the armed guards, and the platoons of marching soldiers, perhaps I could locate the source of the sound. I thought this was a good plan that would make for a really good premiere podcast episode. It was also a good way to get myself into a lot of trouble, so instead I contacted the Deputy Public Affairs Officer for Joint Base San Antonio. Major Jamie Dobson agreed to meet with me to help uncover the story, behind the morning boom. (laughs) The first thing I notice about Major Dobson is her warm and inviting laugh. One doesn't typically associate laughter with an army officer, but Major Dobson immediately makes me feel at home at Fort Sam Houston. (laughs) When we first arrive on base, I assume I'm being taken to see a large and intimidating cannon. But instead, I'm taken to see a large and intimidating horse. These guys, aren't they gorgeous? They're kind of big. They're a little big. (laughs) The dark brown horse approaching me is really big. I learn it's a type of draft horse known as a percheron. Like all work horses, it's a large and powerful animal. It looks like one of those Clydesdales you see in a Budweiser commercial. Percherons are actually larger, though, and they don't make you thirsty for beer. I'm so focused on the horse towering above me, I don't notice that we've been joined by a man wearing a black work shirt, blue jeans, and cowboy boots. Hey, Sergeant Neald, are you ready for us? This is Sergeant First Class Sean Neald. He sports a crew cut and a friendly smile. He's the platoon sergeant for Fort Sam Houston's caisson unit. What does the platoon sergeant of a caisson unit do all day, you ask? This is what Sergeant Neal does all day. He plays with horses. Yeah. But... Tough job. Somebody's got to get that. Um, I've got... We follow Sergeant Neal into an old brick building where he continues to talk, not about the equipment used for firing cannons, but about the equipment used for riding horses. Um, these are all our, our, our saddles that we use um, for ceremonies. The saddles that are across the way are our training or casual riding saddles, as you saw. As I listen to Sergeant Neal, I become concerned uh, that he's all horse and no cannon. But when he starts explaining what a caisson unit is, it all begins to make sense. Our lineage goes all the way back to the Civil War um, for the caisson and the cannons. Back before there were Jeeps or Humvees, teams of draft horses, much like the one I just saw, were used to move the Army's cannons around the battlefield. Connecting the horse to the cannon was a two-wheeled cart. On top of this cart was a box filled with all the cannon's ammunition. These carts were called caissons, which is the French word for box. Back in the day, caissons were kind of important. In 1917, John Philip Sousa referenced them in the chorus of the U.S. Field Artillery March. Over hill, over dale, we will hit the dusty trail as the caissons go rolling along. 
If that tune sounds familiar, it's because in 1956 they changed the words and made it the official song of the United States Army. First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might and the army goes rolling along. But even as Sousa was composing the original tune, motorized trucks were replacing teams of horses as the preferred way of transporting field artillery. In the process, caissons became obsolete. Except they didn't. One thing I didn't mention was that caissons weren't just used for transporting cannonballs. After a cannon and its ammunition were deposited at the front lines, caissons and the horses that pulled them would be repurposed as ambulances. They would transport the wounded from the field of battle to field hospitals. They would also be used to transport the dead. The association of caissons to funerals survives to this day. Caissons are still used to bear the caskets of the deceased in both state and military funerals. If you've ever seen footage of John F. Kennedy's funeral procession, you've seen a casket carried on a caisson. Anybody that hears caisson, they, they automatically know that our, our primary duty is to provide services for our fallen. When a member of the armed forces dies and receives full military funeral honors, the group responsible for transporting the flag-draped casket to the cemetery is known as a caisson unit. To perform these ceremonies, the United States Army operates two of these special details. One of them is located in Arlington, Virginia. The other unit is based here at Fort Sam Houston. In addition to these ceremonies, the caisson unit is also responsible for maintaining the health of the horses, training the horses, and training the men who work with the horses. It's an honor to be selected to serve in the caisson unit. It's an honor Sergeant Neild was proud to accept. We get the awesome opportunity to do what we do you know, train, ride horses, you know, be a part of most of the biggest ceremonies here on Fort Sam. This isn't our normal day-to-day -day job. This is a three-year commitment where we're able to come and give the proper honors to our fallen. Sergeant Neild mentions that the caisson unit is also responsible for firing the cannon that sits on Fort Sam Houston's parade grounds. My ears perk up at this, much like the ears of a large percher and horse. It turns out this cannon is actually fired twice a day, there's the 6.30 a.m. firing that I knew about, but there's also a second firing at 5.30 p.m. It coincides with the lowering of the large American flag that flies over Fort Sam Houston. So what time should we get out there? Major Dobson and Sergeant Neal to work out the details that will allow me to finally see the source of the morning boom. So yeah, We have a little time before the evening ceremony, so Major Dobson offers to give my producer, Bria Woods, and me a quick driving tour of the base. So this is um, Staff Post Row, and this is now where we have basically all of our general officers who are on the installation and the SART Majors. For a resident of San Antonio, Fort Sam Houston can be a bit of an enigma. Like the morning boom, I know it exists, but it's not something I know much about beyond what I can see through the fences that surround it. As we drive around, I begin to realize Fort Sam Houston is really a city within a city. Sure, it has the parade grounds and the barracks and the armories you might expect, but it also has schools, houses, even a hotel. So this is also where, very importantly, very important, this is also where the Starbucks is on post. Today, Fort Sam Houston is the center of medical training for the armed forces. Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine medics all come through San Antonio to learn how to save lives. To accomplish this mission, there are plenty of new cutting-edge facilities. But Fort Sam Houston has been around since 1876. And so, just like in San Antonio, you're constantly coming across historic buildings where historic people did historic things. This is actually where Eisenhower proposed to his wife, Mamie. And so, um, you know, that's pretty cool. It's, it's kind of like a a little bit of romantic military history if, if that happens very often. As we wrap up our tour, we drive by the old Brook Army Medical Center. The six-story brick building once housed the Army's premier medical institution. It's since moved out to its current location off I-35, but for decades, hundreds of thousands of wounded soldiers were treated right here in the heart of Fort Sam Houston. And so this is used as administration offices now? This is the, uh, the headquarters for Army South, which is the Army Component Command for uh, Southern Command, Southcom. So you have the defense of the whole Western Hemisphere for the Army stationed on Fort Sam Houston with Army North and Army South. But it's a, it's a beautiful building. Sorry, can you say that again? You said the command for the whole, for the... The defense of the whole Western Hemisphere for the Army is stationed on Fort Sam. So wow. you have Army North and Army South 
responsible for those two geographic areas. Wow. <laughs> I had no idea. This was yeah. literally in San <laughs> I had no idea either. It turns out there's lots I don't know about Fort Sam Houston. Well, having met Woody and Jesse, I can say. <laughs> As 5.30 approaches, we conclude a heated discussion about our favorite Disney Pixar characters and make our way to Fort Sam Houston's parade grounds. That's when I finally see the cannon. Or to be more specific, that's when I finally see the 75 millimeter pack howitzer. The pack part of its name means it's light enough to be transported by pack animals. It was designed right after World War I when such considerations were still important. It was the standard howitzer for American forces in the Second World War, but it's since been replaced by more powerful, more automated weapons. But several of these older artillery pieces are still used for ceremonies. Sergeant Neal tells me that the caisson unit at Fort Sam Houston actually has seven cannons just like this one. Um, this one is primarily responsible for the post flag. My other six get rotated for ceremonies. Unlike the horse I saw when I first arrived, the cannon is actually smaller than I expected. Much smaller. It's only about three and a half feet high, and in order to load it, you have to kneel down on the ground. That's what Private First Class Gonzalez is doing as Staff Sergeant David Chinowith describes the process. Right now, uh, we had to put all the pieces together in order to, uh, so we can fire it. And there are six pieces that go together for it, which uh, Gonzalez already has set up. The round that we use is just a blank round, nothing actually comes out of it at all. But, uh, and then once he slides it up in the middle, once it gets past this little groove here, it's kind of self-loading. So once he closes this, it'll automatically feed the round up inside. And then really from there, all we do is, is wait. <laughs> it turns out the men responsible for firing the cannon are not actually responsible for when the cannon is fired. Pre-recorded bugle calls are broadcast on loudspeakers throughout Fort Sam Houston, and it's this music that determines when the signal is given to fire. Uh, they, they start the music over in the headquarters, and so there's two songs that start to play. As soon as that first note of the second song plays, that's when I signal Gonzalez here, and that's when uh, he will pull it, and that's when it'll go off. Bugle calls and cannon firings were once how armies communicated across large battlefields. At Fort Sam Houston, they're a tradition used to signify the beginning and end of each day. A few minutes before 5.30 p.m., everyone is in place. Private Gonzalez and Sergeant Chinowith are ready by the cannon, and a group of soldiers have marched in formation of the flagpole and are ready to lower the flag. The whole operation is remarkably silent. Silence, it turns out, does not make for a compelling podcast episode. It does, however, provide me with an opportunity to reflect on everything I've learned. For a civilian such as myself, the firing of the cannon may be the loudest, most public aspect of what happens at Fort Sam Houston. But it's certainly not the most important. It's not even the most important thing that the caisson unit does. It's only one small part of a much larger mission. Here in San Antonio, it's not uncommon to interact with someone in the military. We may run into a person in uniform at the gym or at a restaurant. We may see them in our world, but it's easy to forget the very different world that they and their families occupy. When I was joking with Sergeant Neal about playing with horses, it was easy for me to forget that he's been in the Army for over 16 years. He's been deployed twice to Iraq and twice to Afghanistan. When I was laughing with Major Dobson in her car, it was easy for me to forget that she also served in Iraq and that her husband's currently deployed to the Middle East. By spending time with Major Dobson and Sergeant Neal, I may have seen a more human side of the armed forces, but the sacrifice of those who serve our country is very real. It's something those of us who live outside of Fort Sam Houston should never forget. In fact, it's something we should be reminded of several times a day perhaps with something loud and memorable. Perhaps something like a 75 millimeter pack howitzer. Thanks to Major Jamie Dobson, Sergeant First Class Brandon Hood, Sergeant First Class Sean Neald, and Staff Sergeant David Chinowith. Special thanks also to Christine Finnessy and Scott Ball, who helped with the script. Today's chapter was produced by Bria Woods and myself. 
The music was by Blue Dot Sessions, with a special thanks to the Trinitones of Trinity University, who performed the a cappella version of the U.S. Field Artillery March. San Antonio Storybook is a production of the Rivard Report. You can find more information about this podcast and enjoy all the nonprofit journalism the report has to offer at therevardreport.com. Until next time, I'm Brantley Hightower. <laughs>